It's genuinely an extraordinary privilege to have the opportunity to talk about my work on the prevention of depression to this group of people. Welcome to you all. And actually, it's become apparent to me it's a privilege to listen to my colleagues talking about the extraordinary work that they've done and that's happened in medical sciences in the last 50 years as well. I'd like to elaborate a little bit on some of the words um, of Sir John and John about depression and add a sense of urgency and perhaps a sense of hopefulness around the work that we're doing. As we have made extraordinary progress in other areas of health, the World Health Organization is now saying that by 2030, depression may well be the world's leading public health problem in terms of disability-adjusted life years. Wow, why is that? Well, we've heard some of the reasons. Unlike other chronic conditions, it tends to start early in life. Looking at the audience, at the age that some of our children are, late adolescence, early adulthood. It tends to have a relapsing and recurrent course throughout life. And as we've heard so powerfully from Kath, it's extraordinarily disabling in terms of human suffering. Suicide is, of course, the worst case scenario, but it is also very disabling in terms of just the sense of human capital and loss that comes from that. 300 million people around the world right now will be suffering from depression, and how are we helping those people right now? The most typical way is not at all, probably by some margin. The second most typical way is with antidepressant medication. And then the very, very tip of the iceberg is with psychological therapies. And that is the work that I've been doing in Oxford and my predecessors in Oxford have been doing, doing for the last 20 or so years. And we focus particularly on mindfulness. And this is where an area of hope comes in. Because Dora's lovely metaphor of the fridge is something that is thousands of years old. There are parts of the world where people know that actually the sort of mental habits that we have, the way we take care of our mental hygiene, is really important to us, as important as brushing our teeth, exercising, eating well. And what we're doing with our work in Oxford is drawing on those ancient traditions, those ancient understandings, in a secular way, and combining them with the very best psychology that we can to help people with depression learn the skills that can help them stay well in the long term. And Mark Williams, my predecessor, started this work with adults. And let me tell you a little bit about how that is going. I loved the optimism that we heard initially. I do think this is a tractable problem. And here's some of the traction that we've made in 40 years. This is John Kabat-Zinn. He was working at the University of Massachusetts um, as a microbiologist, as it happens, in the lab of Salvador Luria, a Nobel Prize winning um, biologist. And he had been on many retreats in places like Korea. And he was working in this hospital surrounded by people with chronic physical health problems who had been told by their doctors, we've done what we can for you. You're as well as we can get you, and you now need to live with the disability and the pain that are a, 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 a part of the condition that you're living with. And he thought, I'd like to dedicate my life to putting together a program that can help people with chronic physical health problems use mindfulness as a way of staying well. And that's what he's done. This program is called Mindfulness-Based um, Stress Reduction. It's been evaluated in, uh, I'd say, over 100 randomized controlled trials. It's widely available around the world as a way for people psychologically to manage their own health, their own condition. And Mark Williams, as John said, my predecessor, thought this could be helpful, helpful with recurrent depression. Can we use the same mental trainings? Can we use the very best psychological science? And can we use that to teach people with recurrent depression the skills to stay well? Again, a group-based, eight-week program that's now been evaluated in over 10 randomized controlled trials. And this study in JAMA Psychiatry, 1,258 people, suggests not only can it help people learn skills to stay well, it can provide an alternative 
to antidepressant medication. And actually, just listening to Kath, we're looking at some data at the moment about how people manage medication alongside psychological techniques. And that's the sort of insight that comes from these sorts of evenings, that actually that synergy might be part of the solution. Mindfulness is not the provenance. Well, ancient wisdom would say mindfulness is not the provenance of people with chronic health problems or depression. It's the provenance of all of us. And there is increasingly a mainstreaming of mindfulness as a way for all of us to manage the franticness and the challenges of everyday life. This is just one example study um, in Lancet Public Health showing that in young adults at university, if they learn mindfulness, it is a way for them to manage the demands of university and maintain their mental health and well-being. Um, and our work is now moving further upstream, as we heard um, already several times, to adolescents. Can we intervene with people before mental health problems start to mature, start to ripen? Can we teach people skills in the window before those problems tend to first arise? So in a schools-based study with about um, 25,000 children across the United Kingdom, funded by the Wellcome Trust, we're currently asking that question. Can we teach young people these skills to support their resilience and prevent mental health problems? And we'll know the answer to that in a couple of years' time. <coughs> Can we collectively envisage a world without the devastating effects of depression? Somebody envisaged the problems that Sir John Bell described earlier. And I think the answer is yes. And I think a couple of the facets of that vision are prevention. I think a second is the lifespan, that to be thinking thoughtfully from the perinatal period all the way through childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and old age. And I think the third, which you're going to hear more about from the next two speakers, is this question of accessibility and scalability. How many people in the audience here have got an app like Headspace or Calm on their phone? Yeah? OK. I love those apps. They're great. But they are not programmatic. They're not using the science that people like Kath and I have developed. Wouldn't it be extraordinary? Headspace, by the way, has got 43 million customers. Calm more. Could these be vehicles for us to scale up and make the work that we're doing in the labs that you're going to be hearing about today as accessible to as many people as possible? And I think that's part of the challenge. <laughs>